Hi everyone, this is Krista Moore and this is the Krista Moore Show. I am going to be filming this show live and I'm actually in my comfortable home studio office space. And this is a really important day for myself and also for my guest. And um, I thought the best way to tee up today's show is to share with you a very personal video that she has um, released today, sharing her story. And um, there's something in this video for all of us to, to hear and to learn from. And I'm just glad that I can share it with you today. And I have a chance of interviewing my friend, Inez Sobzak. And uh, many of you know her as Fitness Inez. But uh, I'm going to share the video first before I give you a chance to to see her. So just be with me, bear with me for a moment and I'll get this video teed up. Yeah, I don't know where I want to start with it. My mother had me when she was 14 in Miami during the 80s. <laughs> she came from Havana, Cuba, and she was addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol. She's been in and out of jail. I was adopted when I was four. I was told very early who my biological mom was and what she had done with her life. So I knew very early not to be that. Never drank in high school. Valedictorian in high school. I didn't start drinking until I got a corporate sales job. And I was put in an environment where drinking was the culture. It was starting to become apparently clear that I might not be different from my biological mom. I had tried to stop drinking several times throughout my life, doing whatever I could in the moment to try to fix it. Some of those rules were like, I only drink wine or I won't drink on the weekends or I won't drink with my kid or it's like I'm this nutritionist, this person who competes you know, super clean lifestyle. And then when I'm not in that mode, it was spring break and I started blacking out and I started making really bad choices. My drinking got unhealthy right after my divorce. I would say, hey, I'm gonna go out with some friends, go out with some friends. That was my excuse of finding a way of just checking out. I was drinking a lot. Um, and I started having some dangerous consequences. I ended up getting pregnant. Coincidentally, my life gave me another lifestyle structure to not drink. And so I continued to believe that I didn't have a drinking problem because, hey, I can go 10 months without drinking. I sure did. Um, until I didn't, I was in a relationship that wasn't working. And I was going through some postpartum my drinking got bad um postpartum got bad so bad one day i ended up in the psych ward i didn't want to end my life i didn't think their life would be better without me but when you have a shitload of tita's vodka in your system with your new depression medicine because your doctor thinks that you're a little bit more sad than normal well it makes for a deadly combination so i was trying so hard to prove to everybody that I'm a great mom and that I can do it. And I just had a really hard moment that time and it won't ever happen again. And it made my drinking secret. It was no longer going to circa and having drinks with friends. It was you know, drinking at the house, drinking in the car. It was drinking in really dangerous ways, but no one seeing it which made the problem even worse because no one knew I had a problem. <laughs> Clearly the way I was doing it wasn't working. So at this point I was just desperate. I went to my first AA meeting, I'll never forget it. And I went in, I was so nervous and I was so scared. And every woman looked at me like this. Like they saw me because what they were seeing was a reflection of them. And for the first time, I just felt like I, could be myself. Like I didn't have to have this dichotomy of two masks, this perfect nutritionist who's fit and 
Thayer wouldn't binge drink and have a drinking problem to this party girl who was making fucked up lifestyles, but luckily she was smart enough to quickly fix it. And in that room, I felt like I could just be one. I had did a fitness competition, kind of was back on the swing of knowing how to control the drinking. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be proactive. My birthday's coming up. I'm going to get my mammogram done before 35. They did call me and said, hey, we really need you to get back in here. A new diagnosis of breast cancer. Again, another moment where I'm in this real hard place with some real hard stuff about me. This was something I had never dealt with before because it was the first time I realized that I might not be here. And now it's not just about me. This is about my amazing human I created. And I'm responsible for him. The best thing I did was I didn't wait till the consequences. I didn't wait till like the DUI or take your kid away or no. Luckily, I didn't want to see that movie. The movie I was living was hard enough. What happened on November 11, 2019? Well, I had been told I'm cancer free. How beautiful would it be if I just stopped drinking too? Just manage this. I never drink again. It was hard because I wanted to celebrate. I wanted to like shout for the rooftop. I don't have cancer anymore. Let's go drinking. But I also knew I don't have cancer anymore, so I need to stop drinking. Uh, and so I did. I just had failed enough to say I'm not going to fail again. And like that's really the reason why I got this tattoo. This says fall seven, rise eight, eleven, eleven. 11, 11, I never fell back down again on my sober day. But I'm thriving now. Business is better. I'm the healthiest I've ever been in my whole entire life. And that's after me and cancer. But life's good. And it's good because I made a choice to make it better. And I've been living by that decision every day. Wow. Yeah. So that, ooh, that was intense. <laughs> yeah, it's powerful. It yeah. is powerful. You know what I love about that, Inez, is all of the messages. There's so much in there for so many people that are struggling in some way, right? Is sure. it single parenting? Is it cancer? Is it an addiction? Um, and it just is such a strong message of commitment and hope that it's just overwhelming. So congratulations. Thank you. Today is my first birthday. Your and first birthday. Let's show us your chip. <laughs> this is my one year chip 365 days of opportunity of choosing differently yay let me get a closer look at that mm -hmm. so repeat exactly what you said this is your chip this is, this is my one year chip it's uh -huh. 365 opportunities of choosing a better path yeah so I got it this morning at my 6 a.m. Jumpstart AA meeting at the Unity Club. It was nice to be there. I kind of felt a bit guilty coming to get my chip because I really haven't been this year. Uh, in light of COVID, we really haven't had meetings. So my one year chip was a bit different. Yeah. Um, you spoke today, right? Tell us how that was and, yeah. and how oh that felt. I was so nervous, Krista. I was so nervous. Um, I've done speeches in the past and I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I wanted to really make sure that, that I represented what one year sobriety should look and feel like to empower a newcomer. So I really wanted to get it right. But my dad the night before, cause he came up to be there for me. 
he gave me this best I know, best advice. And Krista, just stay with me on this one. He said, you know, this isn't a speech. This is a share. A share you can't prepare for. A share just comes from the heart. And I truly haven't shared in a very long time. So I'm yeah. kind of out of practice. So I told the group this morning that advice and I really just shared from the heart and it ended up turning out just well, right? Because when That's you right. the heart, uh, everything works out when you lead with intention and from your heart. And so I think today when we speak on live television or social media, that we just kind of speak from the heart. So this isn't practice or scripted. This is my story. So I know it very well, but um, I really don't have anything planned for our conversation today. Besides, I just want to take the time to be thoughtful that a lot of people might be suffering in silence. And I, I'm sharing mine to allow a bit more conversation about it and allowing people the opportunity to, to raise their hand and say, maybe I can look at this too. Yeah. So. Well, one of the things that I really wanted to dive in first is your story of, I want to say it is a struggle. It is years, really. I mean, how many years were you struggling realizing that, hey, I have a problem. I don't have a problem. I have a problem. I'm making poor decisions because of this addiction. I mean, how long was that suffering? Well, I think I noticed that my relationship with alcohol was different. I didn't get to share this in the AA room this morning and I really wanted to share and I just couldn't find the words to say it, but it was pretty much, I remember one time in high school, I did drink and I blacked out and I came home and my dad reminded me of that story this morning. He's like, you know, you did drink in high school. And it was just that one time I, and I just, I knew right then and there, alcohol is bad. Oh, yeah. this is where, oh, this is what it does to me. So I stayed clear from it. So I think to answer your question, mm -hmm. the first time I drank was in high school mm -hmm. and I did black out because it just didn't work with my chemistry. But that blackout also created the mental association of creating this binary relationship with alcohol of it being good or bad. Yeah. And me, it was bad to so stay away from it. And, you know, I found it interesting that you kind of started drinking when you felt a little bit of the peer pressure um, in your corporate job as a sales yeah. professional. It was just the culture. It was the expectation that uh -huh. everyone goes out and drinks after work and kind of that started it. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, I would love to share just a little backstory behind it, because I think before we can talk about the corporate world, we have to talk about a bit of the relationship I created with alcohol in college. Yeah. So understanding that alcohol was the thing that made me black out one time in high school, I stayed away from it and really kind of kept my head in the books. When I was in college, I was on an academic scholarship. So it was imperative that I did my work, but it was one of those things that like, as long as I do all my schoolwork, then I can go drink. Mm -hmm. And so it created this, again, this kind of aggressive relationship where it was like, be this perfect student, and then you can go party like a rock star. And, and so that was a reward. It was like a reward, but it was yeah. also, the drinking was big. It was like binge drinking. It was a lot. And I do remember a couple times in college, just not knowing how I got here and who was there. And we would talk about these things like it was just a consequence of being a college student. But I think that was when I was starting to kind of have these, I hate to use the word microaggressions, but literally microaggressions with my concept of drinking and my relationship mm -hmm. with alcohol. It was mm -hmm. this thing that you can have a really righteous time after you've done your studies. Mm -hmm. And when you do drink, you drink hard hard because we're not going to be able to drink again all week. Yeah. And so that set me up for this kind of push into the corporate world where I noticed that the more successful you got, Krista, you know this because you mm -hmm. I mean, with all your experience with business and 
sales team, it was like, if I could hang with the guys yeah. drinking, then they could also appreciate my stack ranking. That's right. You know, like Isn't that like, interesting. Yeah. yeah. The more I could drink, the more I could buy a nice bottle of wine with my incentive check, the more it gave me prestige. So drinking equaled prestige for me. Mm -hmm. so then these things are all compacting to my idea of drinking. And it was at this point in this corporate world, you could drink as much as you want, as long as you hit your number and it doesn't affect like you aren't missing your calls, right? Like, right. And you were, you were showing up for work in the morning. Yeah. I, I can't tell yeah. you how many times I would close a deal and I would go into my boss's office and we would have drinks. Yeah. It was, right. it's always been very encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone that has, I think, Krista, any genetic disposition to alcoholism or addiction, it was just a sleeping giant. And I kept on poking the bear. Yeah. With, the incident in high school with the blackout and then in college, more of this binge drinking. And then now in adult world, mixing kind of like business and work and things were kind of getting messy and I was starting having consequences. You know, you know when you were just, when you were describing your relationship with alcohol, I was thinking about other people and their relationship with food or a relationship with a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost like what is the what is the um, addiction, so to speak, that we create this type of relationship that alters our behavior. Mm -hmm. I just think we are all looking to escape or check out in some capacity. Mm -hmm. and we all have our thing. We really do. And I think if this time period through COVID has exposed anything, it's allowed us that time for self-reflection. And Krista, I think people cope with food. I think people cope with sex. I think people cope with social media and they surely cope with alcohol. I know I did every time. It was almost my, it was my scapegoat. Like mm -hmm. it's hard. I'm going through a divorce. I should drink. I have breast cancer. I should drink. But just because you're going through something hard doesn't mean you should make it harder with something that's only going to temporarily help. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I, I, I feel like needs to be said is your message today is about there is hope and there is help if you are suffering in whatever way that might be. But there's another message that I want to talk a little bit about, Inez, because alcoholics, alcoholism has a stereotype or a, a bad connotation. And it's even to the point where to admit I'm an alcoholic, you know, does, you don't get there overnight, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you could share with us maybe your definition of an alcoholic or, you know, there are people that drink pretty regularly. <laughs> um, and I do myself. And I've often wondered, well, gee, I can quit for six months. So I must not be an alcoholic. Sure. And I'm just wondering, kind of from your perspective, what what is what does that mean? Man, that question hits it on the head, Krista, mm -hmm. I would struggle with answering what is an alcoholic and if I'm an alcoholic. And mm -hmm. I know by focusing on that question alone, I wasn't making any progress. So I would encourage in our conversation and maybe even to our viewers that we ask a better question. The question should be, if something is no longer serving us, how do we get it out of our life? And my thing was alcohol. So I had to really address that. And whatever your thing is, you have to take the first step to acknowledge you have a thing. Mm -hmm. And my video was me saying, I have a thing. And if you think you have a thing too, you're not alone. And you don't have to say you're an alcoholic to no longer drink. It's a big spectrum. 
That's right. And you know, it's interesting too, because um, I know people that like, let's say we'll be out to dinner or we'll be at a party and I'll offer them a cocktail or a drink or whatever. And then they'll say, no, I don't drink. And mm -hmm. my first thought is, oh, I didn't know they were an alcoholic mm -hmm. because that's just the way that the world is. And sure. you know, it's, and I have to put some perspective on this. And as I grew up above a bar, mm -hmm. You know, there are alcoholics in my family, mm -hmm. um, but my upbringing was about drinking for pleasure, for fun. And that was our livelihood. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I come into this conversation mm -hmm. thinking, well, gosh, I've been, you know, I, I've been drinking every, almost, not every day, but I've been drinking most of my life since I was, you know, 15, 16. And, and when you ask that question, is that serving you? Like I'm thinking, gosh, I don't know. Yeah. Cause you never had to look at it. Right. Like it's almost a beauty that you don't have to ask that question. Yeah. That's not your thing. But if you're getting that gnaw on the back of your neck, questioning your behavior or comparing your drinking to someone else, mm -hmm. you know it already. And yeah. I mean, in my, in my, cause I can only share from my experience, at least for me, Krista, like I always knew it. I always kind of like, Oh, that's different, but okay, let's keep on carrying on. Let's yeah. go on the outside appearance. You know, I, I wish we could, I wish we could use, use that same language and say, instead of me judging someone because they're not going to have a drink that, Oh, they must be an alcoholic mm -hmm. to how cool they don't like themselves when they're drinking. So yeah. they're just not going to do it. Yeah. I mean, that is cool. Well, now that I've had, I have, today's one year sober. And as I mentioned, that's 365 opportunities where I could have drank during COVID, during Black Lives Matter protests, during the election debacle, crazy. Mm -hmm. during crazy things. I could have done that and I didn't. So I know how hard this is. So. Yeah. And it's, and it is, and it's like, okay, let's celebrate. Yeah. The celebration often aligns with, with Great. drinking, as you mentioned yeah. in, in your yeah. video. Yeah. It really does. Well, regardless of what someone's thing is, mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk a lot about just kind of facing, facing that and realizing I, if I want things to change, then I need to change sure. whatever that behavior might be. Mm -hmm. And, um, you always say it's, it is a one day at a time sure. kind of movement. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit for me. Well, I think in the beginning, I was so hung up with this idea, like how long do I have to prove that I don't need to drink? And so it's like, is it a month? Is it three months? Is it six months? What is the number that I'm shooting for to prove that to myself and to everybody that I don't have a problem with drinking? Um, and I'll never forget, I heard this at a meeting and it was like, don't worry if you're never going to drink. Like, don't worry about if you're ever going to drink again. Just worry about if you're not going to drink today. Okay. And that just matters to me. Like one day at a time, I know for certain I'm not going to drink today. Tomorrow, I can't say. I know I have a lot of tools in my toolbox to make sure that if that happens, I have some backup. Um, but all I know is I'm not going to do it today. And that's yeah. all I focus on. Yep. You so. know, uh, you had posted about sober October mm -hmm. and I knew I was going to be interviewing you on your anniversary. Yeah. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to surprise her and I'm going to do sober October and then tell her that, uh, that she influenced me in that positive way. And, yeah. and meanwhile, October 20th, <laughs> Eddie, Eddie and I bought our new office. Uh -huh. <laughs> And we're like, oh, we have to celebrate. Oh, let, and and I broke my sober October commitment to myself. And I felt like crap. I mean, I was embarrassed, like to my kids, like I couldn't, I couldn't do all of October. I just did yeah. half of October. Yeah. I mean, crazy. So I, I wanted to share that with you, but I, I, I didn't do it. And what? I just, didn't, I didn't have that, um, that daily commitment sure. to it. And it's important to look at and get curious, not to judge it, but to get curious about it. Like, oh, let me get a little bit 
more thoughtful in my choosing of what I'm going to drink and not drink. That's just yeah. something. And what was more important? You know, what did I choose to be more? Yeah. Like you were like, hey, do I celebrate or do I honor my, my commitment to myself? I know. You didn't choose that. You're not always going to. And that's okay, Krista. You're okay. Like, you're okay. <laughs> I was just, I was just thinking about that. I thought I'd share that, share that story with you. Well, I'm going to share this with you. Okay. I wasn't planning to share this, but I have a good friend who embarked on Sober October 2. And she asked, hey, you know, can you help me with Sober October? I saw what she posted. And she's, she's known my sober journey this past year. And so I was like, yeah, but at least for me, what I realized is when you get sober, you realize how hard this is. And I know not to preach to everyone to do it. You have to do it because you want to do it. Mm -hmm. so I'll be here, but I'm not going to force this on you. I just can't. I know it doesn't work. So nevertheless, she's like great at week one. Week two, I don't really hear from her. And she really doesn't tell me what actually happened, but she didn't complete Sober October, brushed it kind of underneath the rug and didn't really tell me. I kind of had to pull it out of her. And I felt a bit conflicted because here I am. I want to help, but I know that in this particular piece of living, you have to want to help yourself. Mm -hmm. And so with that example, I, I would say is that once you get sober, you do have the responsibility now of passing it on and trying to figure out what you do with that new freedom. Yeah. And it sometimes comes with consequences. Like you sometimes are in tough, tough situations. It's kind of strained our friendship, but um, I don't really know where to go from here with that, but yeah, share it. <laughs> Interesting. No, yeah. it is. Um, you know, well, I mentioned before in your video, there are a lot of um, a lot of things that have come up in that video about your life personally. Yeah. Um, from being adopted to being pregnant, postpartum, mm -hmm. um, mental issues, like you said, with the medication and the and the a shitload of Tito's in your system. You know, all of that. And I think that we all have our own struggles, but that video can really impact a lot of people in a variety of ways. Well, let's, and, just, let's just be real. Like, I think right now, everybody's kind of like elbowing for the spotlight, but we're not seeing a lot of authenticity. We're not seeing people really empower women. We're not seeing people really speak about the things that we're really struggling with. And no one's really putting out there the real messiness. And so in that video, I talked about things about my life I've never said out loud that I, I never thought I could have the capacity to share because I was hiding it. I wasn't owning it. I was ashamed of it. So that, that video, I remember the rest of the day, I couldn't move. It took everything out of me. And even watching it, it still takes everything out of me because I know that person in that story, you know? Yeah. I, I know what it took to build her. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like you've been working your entire life to be, to be here today. What I mean by that is you have you've had this journey. It's your life. And you've had so many lessons and you are so gifted and you have so much to offer the world. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like this is very purposeful for you. Yeah. I mean, I'm not opportunistic to ride my own adversity coattails, but I'm not naive, right? Like I feel like sometimes God chooses certain people to have the mountain to climb, to show mm -hmm. others when they get to the top of the mountain that I climbed this. Mm -hmm. Everybody is built to climb the mountain. Yeah. I'm not saying that I'm the chosen one. What I'm saying is I understand that through making it, I have the responsibility of taking one forward. Well, but when I when I think of Inez, that that um, on stage, the bodybuilder, the um, you know the 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 perfect specimen of a woman, 
and you know the beauty on the outside and the competition and taking that stage and then you have this other mask you have this other life mm -hmm. that you were hiding and now you can bring that out and it's it's okay yeah. you're being you not who you are you know you're supposed to be so to speak right like Absolutely. the world's so it's and i think that you had that struggle when you were being the picture of health mm -hmm. but yet you weren't healthy sure i mean to add to that krista i remember when we were walking in isla one of your gifts is having the ability to have the space to let people speak freely about their trauma to be honest mm -hmm. And you and I really hit it off because I shared a lot of the things with you that, um, hi, Ati, we love you too. Hi, Ati. Uh, I have your angel on the wall, by the way. Ati, your angel's right here. Uh, <laughs> I have to show it. Let, let me see it because that angel is amazing. It's in the top corner. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, good, good, good. Well, perfect, perfect. I'm glad we got to see Ati because she's Isla. She's my Oprah. Um, but nevertheless, I remember us walking and you had the ability through your gift to allow me to feel safe enough to talk to you about what I was going through. Mm -hmm. Krista, did I lose you? No, back? I'm here. Okay, cool, cool. I'm back. Yeah, I'm back. Awesome. Awesome personal things. Oh, thank you, Eddie. The best. Thank you. Uh, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, go no. ahead and, and continue what you were saying. Um, I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I saw Ati. We were talking I, about walking. We were talking about walking in Isla. Oh yeah. So I mean, I opened up to you about a lot of the cool things that you and I had in common about, like shared commonalities with our childhood. Um, and I think in the video, like I kind of touch upon, like it wasn't easy in the beginning. Like it's, it's been a rocky road. And I think sometimes people might look at you and think like it's perfect and it's not. So we need to be thoughtful and really showing, showing our, our failures as much as our wins. Like I want to show that I competed and that, you know, I won a competition, but I also should say like, yeah. I really struggled with alcohol yeah. and I overcame that. And that should be almost congratulated as much as me winning a fitness competition. It's the vulnerability that so many of us stay away from, you know, yeah. we just don't go there or there's an imposter kind of syndrome that exists. Right. Sure. And we're, and, and um, yeah. So i just, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And I just want you to know that I love you. <laughs> I love what you're doing. Please you. keep sharing this message of, really? of resilience and determination and commitment mm -hmm. and, and really kind of owning who you are and uh, inspiring others to do the same. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, one final question is, do you have kind of takeaways or tools for people that might be struggling today? And no matter, it doesn't have to be for alcohol, just in general, sure. you know, what can they do to start rethinking and rediscovering maybe what they can do better or different moving forward to, to relieve some of this? I mean, it's a great question. And I, it's one I really think through on a daily basis, because I think you have to go through your toolbox and make sure that you have everything in order. Some of my tools and my sober toolbox is definitely AA. I mean, as I shared, I went to AA initially when I just had realized I needed help. Mm -hmm. That AA is there, regardless if you believe you're an alcoholic or not, is a great first step. So definitely AA and AA has meetings and fellowship and a structure that allow you to thrive. So definitely AA. I also, and I'm very open about this. I speak to a therapist weekly. Yes. Regardless of what type of therapy that you have, I definitely think being able to work through why you might be using your thing mm -hmm. or check out, regardless how many times you might do it is worth exploring. Mm -hmm. 
But then I think lastly, it really is focusing on your mental health. So I stay every day with some type of gratitude and meditation practice. As much as I am a nutritionist and fitness coach, I do work out and I eat healthy. That's a given. I mm -hmm. say things that keep me sober. That's allowed me to put 365 days together is AA, as a therapist, and it's every day making sure that I'm grateful and that I know where my mind's at. Yeah. And when I hear what I hear that is there's no need to do it alone. No. There is help out there, Absolutely. whether it is through um, different groups or associations or mm -hmm. alignments or or therapy. And then taking care of ourselves and putting ourselves first. Sure. And making sure that we have that gratitude and we have that daily reminder, that daily reset of yeah. our mindset. You can't get clean off of yesterday's shower. You can't. Oh, that's good. That's a good one to remember. Um, yeah. Aki says that everyone should go to the 12 step. Yeah, everyone, like, even if you don't yeah. have a problem. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, because it, it helps you become a better person. That's you know, my funny. relationships with people have gotten better because, you know, I stopped drinking, but I was working on the reasons why I was drinking and really kind of fixing those behaviors through a structured program. So um, definitely, I think everybody can benefit from working on themselves a little bit, especially. Yeah. Now. That's great. So. Well, thank you so much for um, taking the time out of a very special day to celebrate your sobriety uh, with the world. Yeah, um, I'll be sharing the video. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to make sure, Inez, if people want to connect with you and stay connected with you, what's the best way to do that? I am on social media. I am on Instagram and at Fitness, F I T N E Z. You can also contact me for any media inquiries at www.fit-nez.com. Thank you. Perfect. All right, sweetheart. That Have a great ready. rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye, hun. And I just want to thank everyone for taking some time today to listen to this very powerful message about determination and commitment and celebration in a clean and healthy way. So I'm so proud of my friend and I want us all to be just be thinking about are, are there things in our lives that aren't serving us? And are there things that we could be doing better or different to live with more purpose and meaning? So until next time. Take care and I'll see you soon. Thanks.